Now let's have a look at the infamous gold derivatives. Gold derivatives are what I call paper claims to physical gold. They are commonly referred to as gold exchange traded funds, or in short, gold ETFs. In this presentation I will use these different terms as synonyms for the same thing. Selling of these gold derivatives does not have to be a bad thing on itself. On the contrary, instead of having to move an amount of physical gold each time you trade gold on the market, using ETFs you now only have to hand over the paper claim to gold instead of to real metal. For professional traders, gold ETFs, which are traded electronically by the way, are a blessing because they make trades speculating on the future price of gold a lot easier and faster. Instead of having to reallocate the physical gold to the seller, they just hand over their paper claims to the gold that is located at the vault of the ETF issuer. And the use of derivatives has another very advantageous aspect to it for governments and central banks. Derivatives mask the expansion of the, the amount of money in circulation. Derivatives provided a method to hugely expand the amount of money in circulation without it being noticed when measuring M1, M2, M3 money supply. Because all the newly created money went to the newly created derivatives, the M3 money supply, for example, expanded much more slowly than would have been the case when no derivatives were created. And thus, inflation went unnoticed. On this slide, it is depicted how the sales of gold ETFs work. At first, an ETF issuer puts, let's say, one ton of gold in its vault, and in order for traders to trade without having to move physical gold, the ETF issuer ho holds the gold for them and issues paper claims to this gold that will trade freely on the marketplace. Traders who use gold ETFs trust that at any time they can hand back their ETFs to the issuer and get the physical gold in return. Because they trust the gold their ETFs claim actually is in the vault of the issuer, most of them won't bother to actually demand the physical gold their ETFs hold a claim to. It is estimated that only on an average only 1% of the gold ETFs the of the gold that ETFs hold a claim to is actually demanded to deliver in physical gold. When only a fraction of the gold the ETFs hold a claim to is actually demanded, it is the perfect environment to issue more paper claims to gold than there actually is gold in the vaults. And as history has shown us time after time again, the issuers of the paper claims to gold always seem to have trouble resisting the temptation of handing out more paper claims to gold than they actually have gold in the vaults. The practice of issuing more paper claims to gold can go unnoticed for quite a while, provided the mass of the people won't demand the physical delivery of the gold they own a claim to. Just watch the documentary Money is Debt or The Money Masters to understand how today's fractional reserve banking scheme and fiat currencies have come into existence. The same scheme of using paper claims to phantom gold the early bankers and goldsmiths used could be in place right now without the world noticing. I wouldn't be surprised when history would just repeat itself. Selling gold derivatives not backed by gold. When the issuer of ETFs issues 10 times as much paper claims to gold than he has physical gold in his vault, a problem occurs when rumors hit the market that the issuer of the claims to gold doesn't actually have the gold claimed. By supplying claims to gold to the market that people perceive to be as good as physical gold itself, an artificial extra supply of gold is created which will depress the price of gold. This practice of creating a phantom gold supply serves the central banks and probably is the best way to suppress the price of gold currently available. In the case depicted on this sheet, far more ETF holders demand physical gold in exchange for their ETFs than normally would be the case. The issuer of ETFs has a serious problem on its hand. He's one ton of gold short. When he has 
to admit that he can't deliver the gold. The Ponzi scheme in which he, like many others, participate will collapse and the price of gold will explode. In order to prevent this from happening, he tells his ETF holders that due to unusually high demand, it will just take a little longer to deliver the gold. And in the meantime, he goes to the central bank to ask for the gold needed. In this case, the central bank will be more than happy to deliver the supply of gold needed in order to prevent triggering a panic among ETF holders worldwide and cause the scam to be exposed. So the central bank, at least in the short run, will cover the losses in this ETF scheme. But when the central bank, for whatever reason, can't deliver the gold in the time frame demanded, the only way to solve the problem is by paying ETF holders the spot price of the gold they hold a claim to, plus a large premium for keeping quiet about it. The only problem is the ETF holders are not obliged to accept this offer. Once an ETF issuer fails to deliver and the cash settlement will not be accepted, the scam will be exposed publicly and the music of the game with the golden chairs will stop. Now let's have a look at short selling gold derivatives. This slide explains the essence of the problem with short selling gold derivatives. In chapter 8 we will have a closer look at the problems that arise from short, se short selling gold derivatives. For now the key part to understand is that short selling of gold derivatives tunnels double the amount of money to an ETF that would normally be the case. So even when the ETFs are fully backed by gold, the amount of money that would normally flow to physical gold is now cut in half. A large banking firm that holds thousands of ETFs for customers can suppress the price of gold using this technique and earn a profit for itself doing so. As long as not all the ETF owners uh, claim their ETFs at once, there is a problem. There's a there's no problem doing so. Naked short selling gold derivatives. In this day and age, you don't even have to be an issuer of gold ETFs, owning or claiming to own the gold ETF state, um, to suppress the price of gold. When you are a large banking firm with the reputation of having vast resources, you can create phantom gold that people perceive to be real gold as well. This slide depicts how it is being done. Goldman Sachs, for example, which is a very large banking firm whose former employees represent a large part of the US government's financial advisory board, buys, let's say, 1,000 ETFs at the price of $1,000 an ETF. Then Goldman goes to the marketplace and instead of selling the 1,000 ETFs it owns, it offers the market IOUs to 1,100 ETFs. The marketplace sees Goldman offering IOU IOUs to 1,100 ETFs and thinks, oh well, Goldman even made huge profits during the market crash, so they are definitely good for delivering on their promises this time. So the market buys Goldman's IOUs to ETFs and because of this trade, there has been created an extra supply of gold that should drive the price of gold down. So this way the price of gold can be artificially suppressed as well. When eventually ETFs are demanded for Goldman's IOUs, Goldman can either buy new ETFs and supply these or settle in cash. As long as the reputation of Goldman remains solid and whistleblowers don't sound an alarm bell, this scheme can be continued and repeated over and over and over again.